Uh, hello, my name is Jackie Sullivan, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy here at Western. And it's a real honor today to introduce Dr. Hannah Picard. Um, Dr. Picard received a PhD in philosophy from All Souls College at the University of Oxford in 2001. From 1997 to 2005, she was a fellow by examination at All Souls. And since 2006, she's been a 50-pound fellow also at All Souls. Um, since 2007, she has been an assistant team therapist at the Oxford Health National Health Service Foundation Trust Complex Needs Service. She also ha held a Welcome Trust Biomedical Ethics Clinical Research Fellowship at the Oxford Center for Neuroethics from 2010 to 2015. <coughs> And since 2015, she has been a professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Birmingham. Um, from 2017 to 2019, she'll be a visiting research scholar in the program in cognitive science at Princeton University. Um, what's so exciting about Dr. Picard's research and what really sets her apart from other philosophers working in philosophy of mind, philosophy of psychiatry, moral psychology, and clinical ethics is that she is both an analytic philosopher and a therapist who works with patients with personality and related disorders. Moreover, her work in these two contexts is mutually informing. Her experiences working with patients in therapeutic contexts have prompted her interest in specific philosophical questions about mental illness. And to answer these questions, she has developed a set of conceptual tools that have in turn served to inform and shape her therapeutic approaches. Her articles have appeared in a number of top venues in philosophy and medicine, including philosophy and phenomenological research, mind and language, and the Journal of Medical Ethics. Dr. Picard is currently engaged in two large-scale research projects. The first concerns what she refers to as responsibility without blame. The basic idea is that in clinical contexts, we often take a stance towards patients that involves holding them responsible for their behavior, but not blaming them so as to facilitate learning and change. This is not an easy stance for clinicians to adopt towards their patients, and Dr. Picard has sought to develop a conceptual framework that she has used as a basis for training in mental health contexts. The focus of Dr. Picard's second research project, and the one that she will speak to us about today, is addiction. Um, in her work, she's sought to challenge the popular idea that addiction is a neurobiological disease of compulsion. She thinks that in the case of chronic addicts, we should instead regard drug and alcohol use as a choice that is not only purposive, but also to some extent rational, given the socioeconomic environments and comorbid <coughs> mental health problems that addicts face. Such choices involve cognitive processes that are not captured in neurobiological models of addiction. And so she'll be talking to us about these and related issues today in her talk, um, Why Addicts Use, Getting Real About Drugs, Identity, and Adversity. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Picard. So thank you so much for inviting me. It is a complete pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks especially to Jackie for that warm and lovely introduction. So my hope today is to convince you that a lot of what we as a society believe about drug use and addiction is hype or myth or false ideology. And also to begin to replace that with something closer to the truth. But I stand here, of course, as someone who used to believe that myth. And I don't know if it was evident from Jackie's introduction, but I'm, in fact, Canadian. I grew up in Kingston, not too far from here. And I was at my parents' before coming to give this talk. So in the course of that, thinking about giving the talk and being at my parents', I was reflecting on my childhood. And the kind of drug education I had growing up in Canada in the 70s and 80s. And I remembered this. Does anyone else? Yes, good. Fantastic. So those, those of you close to my generation remember this fantastic public education campaign that came out of America's war on drugs, where on the commercials, somebody would hold up an egg and say, this is your brain, and then crack it. And it would sizzle in the frying pan. And then they'd say, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? <laughs> OK, and you, no questions. That's it. We knew what drugs were, right? And what they did to your brain, they fried it like an egg in a pan with some olive oil, if you're lucky. OK, so I was thinking this is a particularly good example of why it is important to debunk the myth and false ideology surrounding addiction. <laughs> 
This was supposed to be a public education campaign, right? Where's the education, right? What have you learned about drugs and how to use them safely from that campaign? So most of us now agree that just say no isn't good enough sex education. We don't tend to think about that question with respect to drug education. It's not good enough drug education either. Right? So children need to know the real dangers, not the hype, the myth, the false ideology. And they need to have information about how, if they're going to use drugs, they can do so safely. We can't give them that information if we don't have it ourselves. Most adults in our community don't. Most educators don't. So that kind of acceptance of the hype, the myth, the ideology stops us from, for instance, helping our children learn what they need as they face a hard world where they will encounter drugs. Kids do try drugs. I tried drugs despite this campaign. I'm sure many of you did too. And it also stops us helping addicts because we need accurate information, and they need accurate information if they're to make the changes necessary to move on and get better lives or to manage their drug use in ways which cause them less harm. So it's not just a question of academics, although it is, I think, very interesting what drug use is and how we should understand addiction. It's also something which matters for our larger society. And for me, my understanding has progressed through my work with patients with personality disorders, many of whom have drug and alcohol problems, and also my work in cognitive science and philosophy. But one of the things that I want to emphasize is that debunking the myths has not always been easy or comfortable. I used to believe it was just a brain disease that fried your brain. I don't believe that anymore. The answers don't just involve looking at the pharmacology of drugs and the brains of addicts. They involve looking at aspects of, our, of ourselves and our society which are sometimes uncomfortable and hard to face. So one final preliminary, and then I will get on to the meat of the talk. When I talk about drugs, I mean to include alcohol. Now, when we talk about drugs, we often talk about drugs and alcohol. That's a really common phrase in addiction research and popular culture. As if these two things are different, there's drugs and then there's alcohol, which is not a drug. Alcohol is a drug. It is, in fact, one of the most addictive and harmful drugs currently in use in our society. And it matters that those of us who use alcohol acknowledge that we are drug users. Why does it matter? Drug use and addiction is one of the most highly stigmatized condi conditions. Stigma is a mark of social disgrace. It's a mark of ostracization. It impacts on people's self-identity, their sense of self-worth and self-esteem. And it is also, alas, something that has tremendous practical consequences. Apart from alcohol, many drugs are criminalized. In addition to that, drug addiction or drug convictions are, in many parts of the world, barriers to a range of services like housing, benefits, employment, loans, the right to vote. And in some countries, not our own, thankfully, within detention centers, they also place people at risk of surveillance, forced labor, and indeed abuse. So the stigma around being a drug user is real. And it's something that beginning to acknowledge that all of us who use alcohol in moderation or more excessively are too, can begin to combat, at least in this small linguistic way, by not pretending there's this divide between us and them, those of us who drink alcohol and those people who use drugs. Alcohol is a drug. OK. So suppose we start with a question like this. Why has it been that drugs are so heavily stigmatized? Why is that true? So the answer, of course, has a complicated historical and socio 
economic dimension. But I want to focus here on something more, more ideological, more philosophical, which is the dominance of a moral model of addiction until basically midway through the 20th century. That's depicted here in Titian's picture of um, the Bacchalin of the Andrians, a wonderful debauched, revelrous occasion. You can see it throughout paintings and history. You can see it in the photography, popular depictions, and iconography of drug use that dominated the 20th and the 21st century. The basic idea of the moral model is this. It has two parts. The first part says drug use is a choice, even for people who are addicted. Okay, It's a choice. The second part takes a critical moral stance against that choice. The second part is a condemnation of addicts and their character as selfish, as lazy, as hedonistic, as people who seek pleasure without thought for the cost to themselves or other people. Now, in our Western culture, typically we think responsibility tracks choice. So if someone has a choice, they're responsible, broadly speaking, for that action and its consequences. The moral model claims that addicts have a choice. It also condemns that choice. As a result, they're responsible for something which is blameworthy and wrong. So the moral model, in effect, legitimizes the kind of stigma and harsh treatment which I just described drug addicts as experiencing. And it's something which, in the last, say, 50 or so odd years, our society has, in large part, not in entirety, but in large part, recoiled against. So the moral model over the last roughly 50 years, again, that's very broad, has been increasingly be replaced by a brain disease model of addiction. Now, on the brain disease model of addiction, laziness, selfishness, pleasure has nothing to do with addiction. Addicts keep using even when there's no more pleasure to be had and they're desperate to quit. And the reason is that long-term chronic drug use is thought to cause changes to the brain which in effect bypass the capacity for choice, making drugs literally irresistible for those who have that brain pathology and who are addicts. So as a result of this, addicts have no choice, they're not responsible, and it is inappropriate to stigmatize or blame them. They need care and help, not <coughs> condemnation and judgment. So. Our current ideology around addiction pits these two models together, pits to these two models against each other. There's on the one hand this moral condemnation, there's on the other a brain disease model, no moral condemnation, but at the cost of choice. And part of what I want to try to suggest today is that we really need something in between, that both of these are equally problematic. Now, that said, there is something I want us to recognize first about what the brain disease model does. So the brain disease model has been really powerful. Okay, It's been a powerful model of addiction. And one reason, as I just said, is that it combats stigma. But there's another reason which is more explanatory and which is really important, I think, to bring to the fore if we're going to get into focus what we need to understand, what we need to explain when thinking about addiction, and it's this. The brain disease model explains persistent use despite negative consequences. OK. So addiction, as we all know, has multiple harrowing consequences. It can destroy people's mental and physical health. People lose jobs. Their lives are ruined. Their relationships fall apart. They feel tremendous shame. Their sense of self bottoms out. People die. Right? The consequences are really serious of addiction. Now, it is a basic 
folk psychological rule of thumb that people act so far as they can in their best interests. Okay? If you know that an action has negative consequences, you try to not do that action. We use that kind of rule of thumb for understanding each other and explaining and predicting behavior all the time. But that's what addicts seem not to do, right? These terrible consequences of their action, and yet they keep using. There's the puzzle. The brain disease model explains the puzzle. What's the explanation? Well, if they could stop using, they would, but they can't, so they don't. Okay, so we have a really good explanation of the puzzle of addiction. But there is a problem with the brain disease model. And the problem I want now to suggest to you is that it's false. Okay, there is just overwhelming evidence that addicts respond to incentives, and so use is not compelled but chosen. Now, there's a lot of evidence. I'm just going to talk about a few different pieces of it. You're free to ask me more during questions if you'd like. First piece of evidence. We all know people who quit cold turkey. Anecdotal reports of this abound. People stop. Indeed, if you look at the epidemiological data, the majority of addicts who would be diagnosed with substance use disorder mature out in their late 20s or early 30s without cl any clinical intervention whatsoever. Presumably, the thought is, as the opportunities and responsibilities of adult life increase. <laughs> so people just find a way to quit. They stop. Rates of use are cost sensitive, second piece of evidence. You want to bring down drug use rates, tax it. Indeed, some addicts choose to undergo withdrawal in order to drop their tolerance, so the cost of maintaining their habit is less. So there's a lot of flexibility there if you think about the way in which consumption adapts to market price. Third piece of evidence, contingency management treatment. This is a new treatment developed in the past 20 years or so which is really highly successful with some very hardcore addicts compared to other forms of treatment, which basically offers a structure of very small positive rewards in return for drug-free urine sample. So what happens is about three times a week, an addict will produce a drug-free urine sample and get a voucher, a little bit of money, a lucky dip, a prize, the rewards are graded, so if you make it through the week, you get something bigger, and then you start again at the end of the week. So this is a basic positive reinforcement schedule, which really increases rates of abstinence. So again, it looks like there's a responsiveness to reward, interestingly, very small rewards. The first studies gave addicts $100 a week for drug-free urine, but actually things with much less value work just as well. Carl Hart's done some fantastic experiments in his lab in Columbia with crack addicts from New York, where he offers them a forced choice in the lab between a hit and money. They're allowed to take the hit then and there, or they can walk away having left it with some cash of different values, usually not always enough to buy you a hit on the street, not usually enough to buy you 10 hits on the street. Addicts often just leave the crack and take the money. That happens all the time. Finally, my last bit of evidence, which in ways is my favorite, comes from the history of experiments with addicted rats. Now, um, when the disease, the brain disease model was first gaining ground, experiments were rat with rats were thought to provide evidence for it. And that's because if you gave a rat unlimited access to cocaine, it would increase its rate of self-administration, often ending up forgoing food and water until usually within three weeks the rats died. So what makes an animal neglect basic survival instincts? The thought was the addictive power of drugs. But Rats are highly social animals, much more social than most of us recognize. And nobody noticed that these rats were, in fact, kept in small, isolated cages. Until a fantastic Canadian psychologist called Bruce Alexander came along in the 70s and conducted an experiment called Rat Park. 
So just stop and think. We're social animals. Rats are social animals. The American ad campaign was allowed to ask this rhetorical question. Any questions? So let me ask a rhetorical question. Imagine you are kept alone in a cage for three weeks with nothing but cocaine. What would you do? <laughs> OK. So here's what Bruce Alexander did. He took morphine-addicted rats, not cocaine, but morphine-addicted rats, out of their isolated cages and put them in a rat park. Now, Rat Park was a spacious, naturalistic setting where rats of both sexes could cohabit and reproduce. He offered them a choice. They could have plain water, or they could have morphine-laced water. Most of the rats rejected the morphine water and drank the plain water, even when they experienced withdrawal sweat symptoms, and even when Alexander sweetened the morphine water for extra appeal. Rats love sweetness. So that's a real incentive to take the morphine water. Recent studies with rats complement Alexander's findings. When given a forced choice in laboratory settings between either drugs or either sugar, saccharin, or, and this is my favorite experiment, same-sex snuggling, OK? So the chance to like snuggle up with another rat of, your same, of the same sex. Most rats reject the drugs, even when they're on the self-escalating path towards addiction and choose instead the alternative goods. So you can see them snuggling there. And I have up here a fantastic comic by Stuart McMillan, who has done an illustration of rat part for anyone who's interested. So rats and people are different, of course. But we should have more capacity for choice than rats do. And when they're addicted, they can choose not to use if they have alternatives available than they prefer. So, even in addiction, choice is retained. So here's the thing. I said we needed something in between the, the moral model and the brain disease model. The choice model really faces a puzzle. Suppose you grant me that even in addiction, choice is maintained. Given the negative consequences of using, why do addicts persist? OK, that's the puzzle for the choice model. What can explain why addicts keep using, given what happens to them because of drugs? So what I want to do in the rest of the talk is this. I'm going to contextualize this puzzle all right, to try to give you a sense of how to begin to approach it. I'm going to look at five kinds of answers, none of which come from neurobiology, but some of which do have the potential to be helpfully linked to things we might learn from cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology. So I want to be really clear that in rejecting a brain disease model, I'm not rejecting the idea that we learn things about human psychological processes through doing science. And then, having given you these five ways of trying to address this puzzle, I want to return to stigma and the way in which these five answers might point towards interventions that could help addicts. So first of all, contextualization. Why do people use drugs? The first point, and this is really important, is that there is no problem answering this question. Okay, there might be a problem understanding why people persist. There's no problem answering the question why people use drugs in the first place. So as well as cultural availability and expectations and peer pressure, here are seven well-established functions that drugs serve. Improved social interaction. We all know how nice it is when finally your host at that boring dinner party cracks open the bottle of wine. Facilitated mating and sexual behavior. Again, this should be obvious. Think of the use of drugs in clubs, in parties, at raves. Improved cognitive performance and counteracting fatigue. That class of drugs is the stimulants, everything from coffee, caffeine, to methamphetamines. Facilitated recovery and coping with stress. Who doesn't like to have a drink at the end of a really stressful, awful day? That is commonplace, something many of us relate to. Self-medication for mental health problems. I'm going to say more about this later. But people who suffer from comorbid disorders alongside of addiction and have terrible pain and distress often use a lot of drugs. It helps relieve the suffering. 
sensory curiosity and expanded experiential horizons. Okay, so this is most associated with hallucinogens and psychedelics, right? New experiences, opening yourself up to the world. And finally, euphoria, hedonia, getting high, pleasure. So here's what drugs do. They make things more fun. They make there more sex. They improve your cognitive functioning. They make there be less stress. They make there be less, su less suffering. They give you new experiences. They give you pleasure. Drugs are great, right? <laughs> I mean, like, they are so fun. We should all be high all the time. What's the problem? OK, I am making a joke, but there are two really serious points here. The first is that we have got to keep track of the benefits of drugs if we're going to understand addiction, because those benefits are retained even when people are addicted. Okay, Drugs have a lot of benefits. The second is that there is a problem, and it's when use escalates and negative consequences ensue. Okay, So what does that mean? It means the balance between costs and benefits has shifted away from the benefits and towards the costs and yet people keep using. So that's the important point from this, the first important contextualizing point. The second is this. I've just said that the problem ensues when the balance shifts away from costs, sorry, away from benefits and towards the costs. There is no sharp line letting us know when that happens. So here are the diagnostic criteria for substance use disorder in DSM-5. They are personal level behavioral criteria apart from the pharmacological markers, tolerance and withdrawal. And they involve things like this. Your life starts falling apart. You're not doing what you should. More time and energy is getting spent on drugs. You try to stop and it's not going very well. You form an intention to stop and you don't. You experience cravings. You use even when it's dangerous. You use even when you know you shouldn't, or at least you have evidence that you sh should be aware of that you shouldn't. OK. All of these things are things we can observe, things we can learn about people. How much do they matter? How much is this a cost for you in relation to the benefit of drugs? How much can features in your life, circumstantial features, protect you against, you, you against these costs so they're not really there for you while you retain the benefit? So let me explain. People care about different things. Some people care about relationships more than others. Some people have more relationships than others. Whether drugs is affecting your relationships, whether it's a problem for you that drugs is affecting your relationships is going to depend on your attitude towards your relationships. Equally consider something like wealth. Wealth is a protective factor. Why? Many reasons, no doubt. Here's one. Suppose that you're an alcoholic mother and your alcoholism is getting in the way of your capacity to look after your child. If you're poor, your child may not get to school, may not get dressed, there will be social services involved, the outside world will see cues of that problem. Your child will be uncared for. If you're wealthy enough to have a live-in nanny, you can protect your child from those problems because the nanny can be on the morning shift while you recover from last night's drinking. And your child will be fed and get to school and dressed. And maybe even when the child comes home to, from school, you're in a place where it's at a time of day where you can have some kind of relationship with that child at that time of day. So wealth protects you against the damage that your alcoholism could do to that relationship, or it may do. So the point here is just there is no clear line from a clinical perspective between problematic use and addiction. When it is that costs exceed benefits is idiosyncratic and it's affected by things like wealth, people's external circumstances. Now, I said earlier that in arguing against the brain disease model of addiction, I was not arguing against the way in which science can help us understand features of addiction. And in particular, I think it can help us understand cravings. I'm going to just flag that here. You're welcome to ask me about it in questions if you want. But the key point here is that cravings don't mean use is irresistible. It means you really, really want to use, and it's hard as anything not to.
but the evidence cited earlier shows that people retain that capacity. So, it's easy to see why people use drugs. It's hard to draw a line between problematic drug use and outright addiction. Why then do people use drugs despite negative consequences when they have choice, things are getting bad, and they could stop? So as I said, I want to put on the table five different pieces which I think help to solve this puzzle. And so just to run you through them in outline so you know what's coming, they are these. I want us to look at self-hatred and self-harm, at levels of psychological suffering and severe psychosocioeconomic adversity, which are conditions in which many addicts live, temporal discounting, if that's not clear what that means, I'll explain soon, ignorance and denial, this is something which is part of our folklore around addiction, but really interestingly has not been theorized very much in addiction research. And finally, self-identifying as an addict. I have done some work on denial. I'm just starting to do some work on self-identity. So that's the bit which for me is slightly new work. And in some sense, I really welcome questions about that because it's very much work in progress. So first of all, self-hatred and self-harm. So when I was setting out the puzzle of addiction, I said that here's the thing. People act so far as they can in their own best interests and the interests of other people they care for, right? That's a basic folk psychological rule of thumb for explaining and predicting behavior. Well, it's not for everyone. So the population I work with is a population where deliberate self-harm is common. Part of our understanding of this has to do with the fact that most people who self-harm come from uh, backgrounds of severe mistreatment where they may well have suffered physical or sexual or emotional abuse and have grown up in contexts where uh, it is quite understandable that their sense of self, of self-esteem, is low. They hate themselves. They think they deserve the bad things they get. They punish themselves, and they act on those thoughts and those feelings. So addiction can certainly be comorbid with patterns of self-harm. But even when it's not, it's often found in people who may well come from those kinds of backgrounds where they have suffered similar forms of childhood mistreatment. And in those cases, First of all, the consequences, the harm, may be desired. But even if they're not desired, the person may not care enough about themselves to care about those consequences. Okay, so the, the first piece of the puzzle is to have on the table a realistic understanding of a self-destructive mindset which people can have and which a lot of our theorizing fails to recognize. Okay. The second piece of the puzzle is to think about not only the self-destructive mindset, but the psychological environment in which addiction typically occurs, as well as the socioeconomic environment. So of course there are outliers, but long-term chronic addiction is associated with people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds of poor opportunity and have comorbid mental health problems, in particular personality disorders and mood disorders like depression and anxiety. Now, there are two things about being such a person. One is that you experience a lot of psychological stress and suffering. Depression, anxiety, personality disorders are characterized by strong negative affect. You feel terrible a lot of the time. The second is that you don't have an environment which offers you a lot of goods, a lot of alternatives, a lot of hope, which might give you a way out 
of some of the suffering insofar as it is environmentally connected or alternative means to manage it. So the thought here is that you're in pain, there's not a lot in your life, drugs will take it away, okay? In that context, there's something rational about choosing to use, why wouldn't you? And connected to that is the next point which has to do with temporal discounting. So I said I would explain this I said I would explain this if you didn't know what it was. I'm going to try to do it very simply, but here's the thought. Imagine yourself in that context of suffering, in that context where there are not a lot of alternative goods in the environment. I said, drugs will take it away, right? That's what they do. Now imagine you choose not to use. What happens? Does the wonders of an abstinent, drug-free life materialize at your door? No, they're in the future and they're uncertain. So we have this, um, this saying, this common sense saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Okay, this is very much part of an addictive mindset. We all know, well, we know that all humans, to some extent, um, overvalue goods the nearer they are to us in time. So when if something is immediately available, we increase its value relative to the value we would think that same thing has in the future. Addicts do this more than other people, okay? So the, the way in which the immediacy affects their assessment of value looks like it's sharper than for the rest of us. On the other hand, for many addicts, if you place them in the context I just described, there's something rational about that. They've not, on the whole, lived in contexts where future goods materialize. People do what, they're gonna, what they say they're going to do. And if you just resist things in the present, it all works out in the future. That's not been their experience. So there's this tendency to choose a present good as opposed to undergo what you would undergo, the suffering, the withdrawal in the present for the sake of the future, which addicts have more than the rest of us. There's one more thing I want to say about this, which is connected again to the self-destructive mindset which I spoke of at the beginning. And for me, it's been something which um, it took me a long time to see, and which I, I guess for me, I would like to understand better than I do, but it's been very powerful in my clinical work. Um, a lot of people who have mental health problems, who have a self-destructive mindset, who live in impoverished, disadvantaged conditions, have what I've come to call a suicide card. Things are really terrible. And what the suicide card means is that they feel like it's in their back pocket, and if things ever get so bad that it's just unbearable, they will play the card. That is their escape, it's their way out. They are committed to killing themselves if things really become unbearable. Now. There's a real power and importance in that. It gives a person a feeling of control, okay? They can actually do something to take control and take away the pain. It's extremely, uh, it's extremely counterproductive to making changes and to any therapeutic work. And it took me a while to see why, but here's why. If you have that card in your pocket, it's never worth going through the pain now for the sake of your future. Because if it's too bad now, you will play your card and there will be no future. So it completely undermines the idea that it might be worth it to undergo withdrawal, to deal with the suffering, to have periods where things are not good for the sake of the future. Because you're out if they get too bad. So there's a way that all three of these first pieces of the puzzle interact in human psychology in complicated ways, which make it harder and harder and harder for addicts to choose now to undergo the suffering, to have the, to, to undergo the suffering they would without drugs for the sake of the future. Because the benefits are in the present, the costs are in the future for drugs. If you shift that, you stop taking the drugs, the costs are in the present, the benefits are in the future if they come at all. Okay, fourth piece of the puzzle. Does anyone recognize these ads? <laughs> 
No, okay, yeah, they're from a long time ago. Um, ignorance and denial. So this is a this is a piece of common law around addiction, and in fact, it's part of the, the it's part of AA, and AA is thinking around uh, recovery. Addicts are always in denial; they deny they have a problem, right? We've done very little to theorize that in philosophy and the cognitive sciences. Actually, I think we have huge resources to make headway with this piece of the puzzle. But here's the thing. If you know an action brings about negative consequences and you're a person who acts in your own best interest, then you are motivated not to act that way. But you need to know about the negative consequences for that motivation to be effective. That knowledge is not something that comes for free. Now, let me tell you about these pictures. So these pictures were part of an incredibly successful advertising campaign by the tobacco industry when people first started guessing that smoking might cause disease. Up until mid-20th century, nobody thought smoking was bad for you. It was part of everybody's life. Everybody did it. There was then an inkling that it might be problematic, and the industry lobbied the government and got doctors and everybody else to tell moms it was good for their babies to smoke. OK. Why stop smoking? It's good for you. There's no problem here. So here's the thing. You need to know that your actions have negative consequences if those consequences are going to motivate you to act differently. You need, in other words, causal knowledge of the effects of drug use on your life. Now, there are two kinds of causal knowledge that are relevant here. One is large-scale generalization. So this is the kind of knowledge like smoking causes disease. How do we get that knowledge? It requires massive longitudinal efforts by a research community. right? So that was established through large-scale population studies followed up by confirmatory animal models. It then needs, so, so scientists learn smoking causes disease. It then needs to be disseminated. People then need to believe it. And they need to apply it to themselves. They need to overcome any tendency to think, not me. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, maybe yes in general. But people need to be able to apply this probabilistic thinking to themselves and accept it. That's the first kind of generalization you need. The second kind of generalization is an individual generalization. Some facts about drug use you can learn in your own case. So for instance, in my case, smoking makes me have a headache. How do I know that? It's never been my, it's never been my drug. How do I know this? Well, when I started, I got a headache. I smoked, I got a headache. And then I did some tests. I was like, OK, so I'm just going to stop smoking. No headache, smoke, headache. What did I do? I intervened and manipulated my action smoking and monitored the effects, headache, no headache. And I came up with the hypothesis, smoking causes me to have a headache. So I've now chosen not to smoke cigarettes because it gives me a headache. OK. Neither form of knowledge is available through introspection. And even that first personal knowledge is a question of trial and error. And if you think that a lot of the consequences of drug use are enmeshed in a causal network. So here's a classic example. Um, somebody's drinking is getting worse because they are really unhappy in their marriage, but their drinking is also contributing to the failure of the marriage. If they stop drinking, the marriage is not just fixed. They don't get the kind of confirmation that I got when I didn't smoke and then didn't get a headache. So, the point is that the kind of generalizations you need here are hard to come by. It's a cognitive achievement to get them. If somebody's just ignorant, there's no question why they continue to use. Why not? They don't know about the negative consequences. Given that it's an achievement, if you're motivated not to recognize those consequences, because what would that mean? It means you would have to stop using You've got an area of cognition that's really ripe for denial, for self-deception, for motivated belief. So I think this is a really important piece of the picture to start getting serious about the role that cognitive processes play in addiction, motivated irrationality.
Okay, fifth piece of the puzzle. Why use drugs despite negative consequences? I'm an addict. That's who you are. And who else would you be? So this is something that, for me, I've only just started thinking about. Um, it's a complicated thing to think about. Self-identity is a complicated construct. And I want to introduce it to you by doing something that a speaker should never do, which is having a slide with a lot of text, and then I'm going to just talk you through a few studies. Through, through, uh, few studies. But here's the slide with the text. Um, this is just um, a first personal narrative by an addict named Kate for the purposes of anonymity. So just as a person can feel loss of identity when they lose a long-standing job or their children have grown and left home, it's also common, I believe, to feel loss of identity when recovering from a drug-addicted lifestyle. I had established myself as a druggie. My friends and family knew me as such, and in a way I was proud of my varied life experiences and my street smarts. I'd had an older boyfriend who'd introduced me to the drug scene and who I learned a lot of drug taking practices from. I took pride in the fact that I knew more about drug taking than most my age. At 18, I knew how to cook and filter different drugs for IV use and how to prepare poppies to extract the opium. I knew dosages and strengths for illicit use of prescription meds. I knew all sorts about scoring and smoking dope, but lots of quirky little tricks for increasing your buzz. I became involved in crime, and in a way I was proud that I was cunning and resourceful. Seeing as I'd not done much else with myself over these formative years of early adulthood, I didn't have a heck of a lot else going on with my sense of identity. Around my 24th birthday, I had a big poppy design tattooed on my thigh. It's my way of remembering and respecting what I went through. Over the years, I found I didn't forget the druggy life as I'd feared. My role is now more about being an ex-user, and I'm comfortable with that. I also made some progress on professionalizing my past deviances by using my experience with drugs to help others, recently becoming a board member at an organization that provides needle exchange services and also studying trauma, loss, and grief. This has further cemented my new identity and filled the void I felt. So. Drug use often comes with rich relationships with peers, with a body of knowledge and an expertise that people may not otherwise have, with a sense of self, a sense of capacity. And also, it brings with it expectations. I think this is a kind of a really intuitive way of seeing what drug use can bring in terms of sense of belonging and self-identity to a young person and also how hard it can be to give that up. I'll say more about that in a second. I just want now to also point out to some studies that support the idea that self-identity is really important in understanding why people fail or manage to come out of addiction. And these are Rob West self-identification and smoking cessation studies. So, as always, um, sometimes an informal study is much more exciting than the more formal follow-up. So the informal study that Rob did was just fantastic. Um, he had a, a small group of participants who quit, and he asked them, a week after they quit, whether they thought of themselves as ex-smokers. None of them should have said yes based on probability. Okay, the chance that you really are an ex-smoker when you've quit for a week is very low. 75% at, you know, 75% at least will be smoking again within the year. However, right, this is what's so amazing. 50% of the people thought of themselves as an ex-smoker or said that after a week. And the thing is, everyone who was still abstinent and six months later was in the cohort who in a week said, yes, I'm an ex-smoker. So, it looks like there's potentially some, some kind of correlation with being, to self, being able to self-identify as an ex-smoker and succeeding in being, being an ex-smoker, succeeding in future in becoming an ex-smoker. The larger follow-up study confirmed that, but in a way, because of the numbers and the time scale and doing this kind of epidemiological work is just a bit less exciting. Basically, it shows that if you make a transition to thinking of yourself as an ex-smoker within a year, you're more likely to remain abstinent than if you don't. Okay, so that's a, a robust finding, but it somehow 
less exciting than the, the first one, which is amazing that after a week, people say, yes, I'm an ex-smoker, but you should do that because that's gonna, looks like that increases the chances you really are an ex-smoker. Okay, so why would that be, right? Why would it be that self-identities, self-identifying as a smoker means you stay a smoker, self-identifying as an ex-smoker means you become an ex-smoker. So I think there are two things to say here. Um, the first thing draws on sociology, labeling theory, philosophy, and cognitive science, and thinks about the way that nouns that label kinds come with scripts that tell us what that kind of thing is and what we can expect from it. So, if you're an addict, and other people think of you as an addict, and you think of yourself as an addict, that brings a lot of predictions, a lot of expectations, which you then step into, because that's what you are. And now if you think back to the brain disease model of addiction, which dominates our cultural understanding, and plug that into the script, there's really not a lot of point in trying not to be an addict because it's a brain disease. That's what you've got. There's not a lot you can do to change that, so keep using. So I think there's ways that we can really think about how having a label which you have internalized can keep you stuck in a place where the stereotype and expectations that accompany that label seem to you things you just must step into. Here's the other way. And I think this came out really strongly in the quote from Kate. Who else would you be? Right? People self-identify as an addict. It's part of who they are. Drugs structure their life. There may be an expertise. It's a habit. It's a pattern. It's familiar. What do you do? Who do you become if you give that up? That's a really big question. That's not something that comes just because you've you know, stopped using that day. So there's something familiar and known and yours about the identity as an addict, and something unknown, potentially scary and to be discovered as stepping into an identity which is not an addict's identity. And that's a really hard thing to do. That's a big piece of work to do. OK. so. To just signpost where we are, I said that we need to take seriously choice in addiction, but that raises a puzzle. Why do people make these choices given the consequences? And I've put five pieces on the table to try to solve that puzzle, which involve thinking about self-harm, thinking about psychosocioeconomic disadvantage, thinking about temporal discounting, thinking about denial and ignorance, and also thinking now about self-identity. But here's the question you might be wondering, OK, but what about the moral model of addiction? Right? Are we left now in a place where having explained, understood, hopefully made some sense of why people choose the way they do, we need to condemn it, stigmatize it, judge people? So here's the thing. No, we don't. There are two parts to the moral model. There's the view that addiction involves choice. And then there's the attitude taken to that choice. Just as addicts have choices, we have choices. We have choices in how we can respond to people who choose to use drugs. We can respond not in a moralistic, condemnatory way, but in a way which expresses care and concern and compassion. How might, we, how might we do that? So I want to end by just talking briefly about some of the things that these pieces of the puzzle point to as interventions we might make, many of which are very obvious. The last one, I hope, will be slightly less obvious. So self-harm and psychosocioeconomic disadvantage. We need better mental health resources. We need to protect children from mistreatment better. We need more opportunities, better social services, education and employment initiatives. Okay? So we need to address the fact that people in our society grow up in terrible circumstances with limited hope. 
That's a question of social, du social justice. Temporal discounting. Well, to some extent, some of what I've suggested about that means that addressing social justice might have an impact on helping people choose for the future as opposed to the present, make those futures more realistically better. But another thing has to do with structuring treatment to recognize the way in which that cognitive process is working. And for instance, contingency management treatment, which I told you about earlier, does just that. So contingency management treatment is where you get the structured small rewards bigging, building up to a bigger reward in return for drug-free urine samples. So on the one hand, the reward is, is immediate. You provide the urine sample and you get the reinforcement. But on the other, because there's this graded, this graded uh, schedule working up to a, a bigger reward at the end of the week, it's future directed. So it works both through immediate reinforcement, but also manages sort of to bundle the week's abstinence together. If you make it through the week, you get the big reward at the end. So it's a treatment which is, in fact, I think, structured to address some of the problems with temporal discounting. OK, denial and ignorance. Well, one of the things we can do is better publication, public education initiatives right, than the American war on drugs stuff. If we have knowledge, we need to disseminate it in a way that people will learn something, take in, actually be able to use. But in addition to that, I think that insofar as part of what's going on is processes like motivated irrationality, self-deception, semi-delusional processes, we have the resources of cognitive science and psychiatry to start to try to tailor treatment to that. And interestingly, that's not really happened. AA works with denial. Other kinds of mental health services that deal with addicts tend not to very much. So there's something about starting to be more serious, I think, about the cognitive processes in denial, in addiction, which should impact on treatment and potentially provide some more options. OK, finally, the last one, self-identity. And then I will stop. Um, here's the thought that I just want to leave you with. Uh, self-identity is it's a complicated construct to understand. It's a harder thing to create. It's not something which seems amenable either to purely rationalistic thinking or scientific thinking, right? It's quite an elusive, abstract idea. So I want to suggest there's something about narrative that can really help addicts and other people trying to change problematic behaviors make that change in self-identity. And here's what it is. When you see philosophical discussions of the idea of narrative, they usually list these features. Narratives are coherent, there's a temporal order, they have power, explanatory power, and they kind of bring with them a kind of emotional closure. These are the sort of large-scale systemic attributes of a narrative. It all looks very abstract, right? very not like stories as we know of them. Think of stories as we know of them. What happens? They're just full of surprises, right? Things that you never thought possible happen in stories. You kiss a frog, and it turns into a prince. That is in defiance of the laws of physics and the laws of psychology, right? <laughs> like stories, Things happen in, sto in stories that we would never predict or expect. Now. Imagine you're a person who is a long-term user and every day you've got up and had a drink. Take a sober scientific perspective on yourself. What should you predict you do today? What does the evidence suggest? Have a drink, right? That's what you'd predict you would do. There's not room for much scope there if we take that sober scientific perspective. But we can really easily imagine a story which begins like this. Something was different this morning. I don't know what, I don't know why, something was different. So here's the thought. First person narratives offer something to people when they are involved in a process of 
struggling to change, struggling to create a different sense of self. And that's something we can acknowledge, listen to, give space in our common culture for. And in particular, I just want to do a shout out in that respect to Aaron Goodman's new project, who's a fantastic, Aaron is a fantastic photographer who's been working in Vancouver with some of the, some of the really vulnerable, very marginalized people who use heroin and has done a project where, in addition to photo documentary, there's photo elicitation, where their comments on the pictures of them that he took over a year are wrapped up in the visual element. So the voice of the people depicted is very much part of the story being told through the pictures. And it's an interesting. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of work. It's an interesting place to go for trying to break down some of the cultural stereotypes and stigmatizing images and attitudes people can have towards addicts. But it's also the kind of project which I think can be helpful and positive for people themselves. And you don't need a great photographer to do it. That's something you can do as a friend, as a family member, help people create different stories. So thank you very much. Thank you.